I would like to welcome everyone to AWC's Winning with Wood in Green Rating Systems and Codes. Today's presenter is our special guest, Dylan Plumley for, from US Ecologic. Disclaimer, real quick, note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. Today's speakers, um, here is the team that is providing this course for you today. Our guest speaker, Dylan Plumley from US Ecologic and our Director of Educational Outreach, Lori Cook, myself, Manager of Education and Accreditation and our Education Administrator, Kim Paulson. Hello everyone, <clears throat> good morning. My name is Dylan Plumley. I hope we are all having a wonderful morning so far. Um, just to get started, um, Go over the course description again. So this is just several uh, mainstream green building rating systems and uh, high performance sustainability codes in use, um, such as LEED, NGBS, IGCC, Green Globes, and ASHRAE 189.1. Um, they have similar but varying criteria for achieving points or demonstrating compliance through the use of material and resources. So today we're going to look at each uh, credits approach for wood sustainability attributes and what information is needed to claim those associated credits. Um, our learning objectives today, um, one for green rating system credits, uh, identify what credits can be claimed for using wood and green rating systems and standards. Uh, two, claiming credits, determine what is needed to claim those credits for using wood. Three, EPDs, uh, explain how EPDs are used by green rating systems and standards. And four, uh, raters observations, discuss the raters observations on projects that use wood. Um, I'm sure we, we all see some form of wood in our professions or at least deal with it in some way. Uh, here's me. Uh, my name is Dylan Plumley. I work for US Ecologic as a QAD, Energy Star Trainer, Field Raider, and Green Raider. Um, we are based out of Irving, Texas. So today's scope, um, kind of reiterating, but we are uh, just going over the different above code programs and how they take wood usage and disposal into account. Um, we'll look at how projects can be rewarded for reducing wood usage in a project and proof that they use the sustainable method to dispose of extra and or waste woods and understand why the above code programs put emphasis on these aspects in building and how it helps the environment to incorporate these strategies into our dwelling building units, homes, okay. So we'll get started with IGCC. So what is IGCC? Well, uh, it stands for International Green Con Construction Code. Um, it acts as more of a guide to sustainable building and lends itself well, thanks to it being a collaborative project with multiple above, pro, above code program entities to accruing points and achieving levels of certification for many of our other programs. Um, using ASHRAE 181, 189.1 as a basis, it takes many aspects and strategies of green building and collects them into a single package that can be used almost anywhere. Uh, it can be seen as more of a springboard into other programs, and you could build a home anywhere following the IGCC and either immediately achieve or be a few steps away from achieving many local code and above code certifications. So just some wording straight out of IGCC's um, code. So at least 55% of the total material used must be any combination of recycled content materials recyclable materials with a minimum recovery rate of 30%, bio-based materials as defined by ASTM D6866 and USDA 7 CFR Part 2902, um, used materials and indigenous materials, which would be materials recovered, harvested, extracted, and manufactured within 500 miles of the site. Um, at least 60% of the wood and wood products used must be COC certified under a certification system developed using ISO TEC guide 59 or the WTO document technical barriers to trade. Um, and all raw materials must be harvested or extracted in accordance with the laws of the country or region of origin. No imported wood that appears on the city's list is permitted. Um, 
kind of a big emphasis on making sure that we're using wood from the local area. Um, and if you're using wood from a local area, you're also hopefully preventing the use of um, maybe tropical or um, non-indigenous woods that could cause a problem for the environment. So ASHRAE 189.1, um, what is ASHRAE 189.1? Well, ASHRAE stands for the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Um, the standard 189.1 is subtitled Standard for the Design of High Performance Green Buildings Except Low-Rise Residential Buildings. Kind of a long-winded subtitle, but uh, it's a collaboration of ASHRAE, IES, and USGBC to come together to create a standard for use uh, in, well, in green buildings today, except low-rise residential buildings. Um, the ma major goals in publishing this standard were to provide simple compliance options for green buildings and to establish mandatory criteria in all topic areas, such as site sustainability, water use efficiency, energy efficiency, indoor environmental quality, and the building's impact on the atmosphere, materials, and resources. Kind of an all-encompassing standard, um, if anybody has ever read through any of the other ASHRAE standards. Um, some of them are a little more specialized um, to one topic in particular, but with ASHRAE 189.1, they kind of took a um, broad spectrum approach to try to come up with something that we could use in, in almost every aspect of green building. <clears throat> so the wording straight from ASHRAE 189.1 um, and their approach to wood. So, uh, wood components used to comply with section 9.4.1.3.1 shall contain not less than 60% certified wood content tracked through a chain of custody process, either by physical separation or percentage-based approaches. And wood products used in the project, other than recovered or reused wood, shall not contain wood from endangered wood species unless the trade of such wood conforms with the requirements of the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Again, uh, we are looking to use woods um, that either are indigenous to the surrounding area or can be tracked easily uh, so that we're not introducing um, invasive species or tropical woods uh, into our homes wherever you may be building. So for LEED V4, uh, what is it? Well, LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and this would be the fourth version of the LEED program. Um, the LEED program was designed by USGBC with the intent of providing a framework for healthy, highly efficient, and cost-saving green buildings. According to USGBC, it is a globally recognized symbol of sustainability, achievement, and leadership, and is the most widely used green building rating system in the world. The program works off of a level of certification system ranging from a base level to silver, gold, and platinum based on how many points have been achieved by the project. I'm sure a lot of us have heard of LEED. Um, the LEED V4's approach to wood, the language straight from their book, um, all wood in the building must be non-tropical, reused or reclaimed, or certified by the Forest Stewardship Council or USGBC approved equivalent. And then this would be a prerequisite. Um, prerequisite, I'm sure we all know the definition of the word, but as far as uh, LEED's concerned, prerequisites would be um, things that you would need to complete or comply with uh, prior to going forward into further credits into each category. Um, so for the purposes of this prerequisite, uh, a tree species is considered tropical if it is grown in a location that lies between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, tropical woods. Projects located between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn are exempt from meeting this prerequisite because those tropical woods would be indigenous to their areas. 
There are also separate credits and prerequisites that can be earned for using efficient framing methods for the building, such as increasing stud spacing or ensuring all wood is kept off the ground, or even not allowing wet woods to be present during the build process before being covered by vertical wall materials. Obviously, we don't want mold inside of our walls. Wet wood is a good way to get there. Um, and most of the categories specifically pertaining to wood are prerequisites. However, some extra points can be earned regarding waste management, which would be worth two points um, if, if we follow the um, waste management uh, protocols. Environmentally preferable products, which could be worth between one and five points, depending on how far you wanted to go down that route. And material efficient framing, which would be one to three points, again, depending on how far you want to go and through the MR, materials and resources credits. Um, so with, with LEED in particular, there are some categories that um, you either do it all and you receive, for example, the waste management, you either do what they're asking and you receive the two points, or you don't follow that and you don't get the two points. Whereas something like environmentally preferable products, um, you could do, you know, one or two things and get one point, two points, or you could follow the whole list and you could get up to five points. Um, and then going back to the way uh, LEED certification system works, um, it would you would be adding all of those points up at the end um, for the whole building, and then that gives you your certification level. Whether you are able to get base or silver or gold or platinum, it all depends on on how far the building project is willing to go um, to meet those those credits and and generally you want it you want to set a goal first of I want this project to be lead silver and then you would have a you know help from a green raider designer and everybody uh, involved in the project to sort of make sure that we're doing the right things to get to that certification level so for NGBS um, NGBS stands for National Green Building Standard. Um, the NGBS is a rating system approved by the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, um, as an American national standard. Uh, it was designed as a blueprint for builders to follow for the design and construction of new and renovated single family homes and multifamily apartment buildings. Uh, this program also works off of a level of certification system ranging from a base level to bronze, silver, gold, and then they went with emerald instead of platinum um, based on how many points have been achieved by the project. So how does NGBS approach wood? Um, under Home Innovation Research Lab's third-party oriented strand board, uh, OSB, Product certification program, products are tested to meet nationally recognized standards. Uh, a minimum of two wood or wood-based products used for major elements are certified to the requirements of a recognized product program with four points maximum. Um, a minimum of 85% of material within a product group, i.e. wood structural panels, countertops, composite trim slash doors, custom woodwork, and or component closet shelving is manufactured in accordance with NGBS guidelines with a 10 point max. And engineered wood or engineered steel products are used in place of conventional products, which would be three points awarded per, per material. Um, so NGBS um, gives a, a lot of their points um, based on uh, using, using engineered products, so green globes, so, so what is Green Globes? Um, the Green Globes program was designed by the Green Building Initiative, GBI, and designed to allow building owners and managers to select which sustainability features best fit their building and occupants. Uh, Green Globes uses more of a custom tailored approach for projects to pick and choose certain aspects of green building to reach any of the four levels of certification in the program depending on how far the client is willing to take it, much like many of the other programs we've seen so far. Um, it has its own cloud-based software to allow verifiers and clients to access, upload, and share information about the project across the whole project team. Um, 
This is actually really interesting. The, the app is downloaded um, from everybody on the project team. It, it kind of works a lot like a messaging service, except that um, it's really focused on making sure everybody's on the same page and, and uh, um, sort of keeping track of the project as a whole as, the, um, as time progresses for the, the building. Um, it works off of a point system that leads to a final percentage score. Um, so to qualify, a home must receive a final score of 35%, but could get up to 100% if all 1,000 points have been collected and implemented by the project. Um, they use a bracket system of a number of globes achieved between one and four green globes based on the project score. Um, it, it, it's a lot like the way um, LEED and NGBS um, choose to go. Uh, it's based on a number of points, and those points uh, determine sort of what bracket you end up with uh, at the end of the project, um, whether you're just a base level or you go be up, above and beyond. Um, one to four green globes is equivalent to base, silver, gold, platinum, or emerald. So <laughs> green globes approach to wood. Um, Points are available for many aspects of the Green Globes program in regards to wood. Um, those include, one, the reduction of wood waste, as well as other construction wastes. Um, two, reusing or recycling usable wood, as opposed to having new wood manufactured for construction, and using wood that contains a certain percentage of recycled material. Um, points can be earned for how the project gets rid of wasted woods, either by recycling, returning to the manufacturer, or salvaged for use by another project with the intent of keeping those woods out of a landfill. And credited points are earned through the materials credit with 150 total points available. Um, if you're wondering kind of how salvaged wood would work, um, it, it could be used from um, another building or um, certain waste woods there that you can't just take a two by four off another project and put it on this one. Um, there's kind of more of a detailed uh, route to follow with that. And of course, records need to be kept if you are using recycled wood as far as um, what type of wood, where it came from. Um, and then the uh, certain percentage of recycled material that, that um, sort of points towards OSB or a similar product, something that is um, recycled wood that has been turned into a new product. And then projects getting rid of wasted woods uh, in, a, in a, uh, a way that the project that the uh, Green Globes would see fit um, could be the use of a recycled company um, to come pick up the waste woods off of the, um, off of the project. And, and you would essentially be giving back to those reusing um, salvage materials and it could kind of end up in a in a, um, a, a loop so to speak um, or if you were to give your waste woods to a company that maybe produces osb or a similar material um, that that could be considered getting rid of those wasted woods um, in a way that green globes would see fit so just to go over some overarching um, best practices considerations. Um, so as we saw with a lot of these projects, or a lot of these um, um, code systems, the focus tends to be put on finding ways to reduce wood inefficiencies, either through recycling, reusing, or lowering the amount of newly produced wood needed for a home. Overall, the goal is to increase the uses and efficiencies of new wood materials being produced in the long run. Um, something like increasing stud spacing to 16 or more inches uh, is a cheap and easy way to begin achieving this goal. Um, while you could say that um, using two by six every 16 inches versus two by four every 12 inches, um, you could get nitpicky with the math on the wood there. Um, but it, it's just it's just in an effort to um, uh, increase efficiencies of the product without sacrificing the um, 
structure of the home um, in using composite woods and recycled filler can also be a cheap and easy way to replace things such as service decks above grade flooring and roof decking um, especially in attics i know that at least in the area that that i'm in pretty much everybody's gone to osb for service decks um, but it, it could be easy to sort of draw that line between um, using a whole bunch of two by fours for your service deck versus um, OSB and, uh, and, and sort of stud bracing below it. Um, and then finding reliable companies to recycle wood wastes as opposed to throwing it in a landfill gives back to the whole process. Like I mentioned um, a minute ago, and when you find these companies that, that recycle these woods, you're in the long run sort of giving back to the whole, um, the whole mission of, the, of, of the, these code systems um, and a couple of them in particular. Obviously, we don't want to um, just throw wood out um, and it, it would be helpful to, even if you're not going for one of these codes, it's, it's always helpful um, to the, the environment as a whole to make sure that we're getting rid of, of wastes in a efficient manner, um, one that could sort of help the globe uh, as opposed to just tossing it in a landfill. I seem to have come up to our QA slide. Q hey there, this is Lori. So we can start with some of the questions that have come in. Our first question, um can you had dylan you had talked about uh preventing or reducing the use of invasive species in construction uh can you talk about this this policy of of discouraging the use of invasive species why specifically are are they something we're targeting um yeah so the the tropical woods um uh, so the the as we saw, a lot of the emphasis is, is put on um, using local woods um, and local manufacturers. Um, and obviously, if you're cutting a tree up, you don't have to worry about that wood making a new tree um, in your in your land. But um, something to consider, just to take it a, even a step further, is um, if it's you know if it's a natural wood that's not highly treated, highly produced. Um, if, if somebody say wanted to use a, a rare um, raw wood that's just been um, cut and measured and laid down, um, you could have um, invasive species of termites or mold. And then the, the, the tropical woods, um, you know, that, that, that came from the, uh, the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer, like we had talked about in that range, those tropical woods could could cause issues with the the um, with the home. Hey, Dylan, this is Robert. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Robert Pegues. I'm Dylan's sidekick uh, this morning. Um, I'm also a ResNet QAD and uh, lead um, faculty. Um, just to kind of expand on some of the things that that Dylan was saying about the tropical wood. So one of the terms that we really, really like to use in uh, green building and sustainability is synergies, right? Um, so the more synergies we have, the better. And what a synergy is, is overlapping benefit. So we're always looking for the net, net, net positive, right? And so when we're trying to discourage projects from using tropical wood, the main driver for that is, is multiple fold. Right. So the thing that first probably comes to mind is rainforests. We don't want to we don't want the rainforests to basically be wiped out um, in the tropical areas because that's pretty important. Right. Um, woods like Ipe um, and other woods that are really sought after. There's a really valuable market in the United States for that and other places. And so if that if that if that drive continues to increase then those areas are severely impacted. So requiring things like chain of custody, FSC certification ensures that if those products are used, they're harvested um, in a way that's sustainable 
um, in a way that's not going to negatively impact um, that region. Um, the other one, and Dylan started to speak on that, but I like to expand just a little bit, is the, the local production. Um, so not only do we not want to use tropical woods or if tropical woods are used, have some sort of chain of custody FSC certification, but we also want to encourage local production, right? So local production, again, is going to hit some of those synergies. Um, we're going to cut down on uh, greenhouse gas emissions just from distribution and other things. Uh, but the, also the invasive species, whether or not there's termites or bugs in the wood itself, sometimes sometimes wood loads uh, can get uh, pest uh, travelers, right? We get uh, unwanted pests and bugs and travelers and creepy crawlies that jump in the pile, uh, get delivered to the site, and then you're dealing with uh, pests and other things that maybe that region's not prepared for. So that's a long-winded uh, response. Uh, sorry for stepping on your toes if I did, Dylan, but just wanted to flesh that, that out a little bit more. No, not at all. That's perfect. Thank you, Robert. That was very thorough. Um, and if, for going forward, both of you, we would certainly appreciate uh, your, your opinions on any question you'd like to jump in on. This question, um, this might not be in, in your wheelhouse for either of you, but you, I'm sh not sure uh, if it's something you've you've encountered uh, in your projects related to tax credits or other economic incentives. Have you encountered any either you know municipalities, states uh, that have offered any sort of economic incentive for? green building certification or are you aware of any such programs that would encourage folks to use them oh i can take this one so yes there is um there's a lot of stuff out there uh, what what i have seen specifically may be limited but there's there's tons of stuff out there so one of them that i can think of off of the top of my head is uh 221 d4 um HUD MIP reduction. Um, and this is for multifamily projects um, that want to, um, they want to leverage an MIP reduction so they, they are encouraged or required to participate in a, um, a green program. So from what I understand, there are currently at least two, I think Green Globes may be on there, but NGBS for sure and Lead for Homes as well um are acceptable programs in order to meet the intent of that um, and the, again that's a 221 d4 um, hud mip reduction um, there's something called a 45l tax credit that's available um, for home builders or the individual building the home whether that's an individual custom home builder or production builder uh, that 45L tax credit is actually up for renewal right now during the legislative session. So it's it's TBD to figure out if that's going to be uh, re-implemented or not. But essentially, that's a tax credit for home builders for um, meeting a percentage above code. Uh, from what I remember, it's 10 or 15 percent above code. Um, and it's kind of changing now. So I, that number is probably wrong. Please don't hold me to that. Uh, but that tax credit is $2,000 per unit. I think there's a proposal to have that 45L tax credit from moved from a percentage above code to a certification with Energy Star. Um, again, that's TBD if that's going to be a new version of Energy Star, but currently it looks like that's going to be based on uh, certification with Energy Star 3.0, and that tax credit is uh, proposed at $2,500 per unit. And there's actually a higher tier that's being proposed now for DOE Net Zero Energy Ready. Uh, that's proposed to be a $5,000 tax credit. Um, again, there are probably others that are out there. They're just uh, not some that we, we work with. Um, a lot of local municipalities will also offer rebates um, for, for other things. I know this is kind of a little bit outside the scope of wood, but I think it's, it's important to know and, uh, and also spurs interest in these programs. 
Uh, one of the things that we have seen is these incentive programs do drive green and sustainable buildings. So if they're offered, you know, it's great to take advantage of and leverage those programs. Great, great to know. Okay, um, <laughs> here's a question. I, I have uh, had some discussions on this topic, so I know that it um, has generated a lot of debate. Uh, when we talk about uh, biogenic carbon, also sometimes called embedded carbon uh, in, in our building products, how do the different rating systems treat that? Is there uh, any sort of carbon accounting that, that goes on um, specifically related to wood, since that's what we're talking about today, but in general as well, uh, biogenic carbon for for building products yeah so i know that lead is starting to address that more but carbon carbon emissions carbon capture um, some of that is included in some of the different lead programs but by and large that's been that's been an area that's been a little bit neglected personally in my opinion um, from what i understand and i'm i'm this is maybe wading into waters that are a little bit out of my depth, to be honest. But I think a lot of it was uh, trying to quantify all that. Um, there's been some discussions about how do you quantify it and if we're quantifying that in the right way. So from what I understand, uh, the uh, embedded carbon question has been largely unaddressed, but it looks like uh, USGBC is, is starting to address that more. Great. All right. Several folks have asked this one as well. Are there any uh, rating systems that are geared towards residential construction? Are there any rating systems that are geared more more so towards specific types of construction? But I think the the uh, references we've seen in most of the questions, folks have been interested in in residential construction. So maybe. Can we talk about programs that might be geared towards residential construction first and then other perhaps building type specific green rating programs that you might be aware of? Um, yeah. yeah, all of the um, all of the code programs mentioned here today have a system in place for residential um, green building. Um, uh, single family and multifamily alike. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of them also have um, commercial uh, uh, systems in place, um, but but they're all um, they all do have their own residential, single family, and multifamily programs. Um, as far as geared specifically, yeah. Go ahead, Robert. I'm I'm sorry, Dylan. I stepped on your feet. You go ahead, man. Um. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, LEED, NGBS, IGCC. Um, these these programs have all have all been. Uh, their their wording a lot has to do with residential building, um, and then they 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 break them into subsections between commercial and residential. But all of these can be applied to residential building. Yeah, I was just going to expand on that, and so that is true, but by and large, there are a couple programs that are a little bit more single-family friendly. So Lead for Homes version 4, specifically 4.1, so when USGBC came out with Lead for Homes, um, they came out with version 4, and what a lot of people, a lot of providers, a lot of green raiders found pretty quickly was, was that most of the projects that we're certifying under version three, we're no longer certifying under version four. Big surprise, right? Because it's a new program. But what it appeared to be was that they tried to do a little too much too fast and it didn't allow the projects and the market to kind of turn in correct. So what they did was they kind of did a, a, a small change that was a little bit more friendly for single family um, projects. Uh, specifically single family production builders to spur and encourage participation. And that program is uh, LEED version 4.1. Um, I know that it was in the beta uh, phase. I believe it's out of beta and is available for anybody who would like to participate. Um, we currently have a single family production builder who builds about 500 homes a year. 
Um, and they have 100% certification for Leave for Home version 4.1 with a lot of success. Um, it is a program that is, you're able to streamline. Um, it's, it's got a lot of infrastructure in place. USGBC has been a really excellent partner in working with us and adjusting as we've come into some issues. Um, so uh, the long short of that is, is LEAD version 4.1 is a great uh, protocol for single family. Uh, and specifically, whether it's custom or production, both of them, uh, I really like it for production. Um, another one that's good is NGBS. From what I understand, there's not a lot of single family participation currently. I think there's a, uh, the, the, the single family production market for NGBS is a little bit smaller, quite a bit smaller than Lead for Homes, but I think that's starting to change. Um, I know Michelle Foster over there is doing a lot of work, a lot of good things to make it um, uh, accessible uh, to a broader audience, while maintaining the um, sustainability impacts. Um, and then Energy Star, DOE, Net Zero Ready, those are all great. Um, HERS ratings, obviously, which would be um, required for most of those programs. Awesome. All right, uh, some questions related to environmental product declarations or EPDs. Uh, we've, we've talked about a few systems today. Um, I know in my experience, LEED has some language for environmental product declarations. Can you all talk about um, how those fit in in the green rating systems and if the, the different systems treat EPDs differently? Yeah, so EPDs is, is uh, again, it's one of those topics that in single family, so I'm a single family um, QAD, and that's kind of my specialty. And the EPDs are more on the multifamily or commercial side that we'll see them. They are included in those programs, but, uh, you know, just full disclosure, I haven't, I haven't encountered them much. So I wouldn't be able to speak too much to that. I wouldn't want to lead anybody in the wrong direction. All right. Um, oh, here's, a, here's an interesting question. Is there such a thing as a certified green building inspector? So we, we as structural engineers, which is, is my background, we deal with all sorts of inspections for the, the structure, uh, obviously in the construction phase while it's being built. Um, are there any sort of inspections that would go on on site for a green building? Yes. Yes. The short answer is yes. Dylan, you want to fill this one? Um, yeah. So there are a lot of certifications that um, can be earned um, by anybody that chooses to be a green raider. Um, a lot of them are specified depending on um, which program you want to be credentialed to rate for. So if you wanted to do um, lead inspections and be a lead green rater, then you would take the lead class um, and then you would um, pass the exam and then become a, a lead green rater. Um, and, and a lot of those programs are, um, they're sort of overarching the, um, in general, you are looking at green building and, and energy, um, but uh, I know, especially from my time in the field as a, a lead green raider, um, you, you are looking at a lot of checklists that have to do with um, things that you wouldn't necessarily right off the bat assume like, oh, well, this affects the energy consumption of the home. Um, because the lead program focuses a lot on other aspects of building like sustainability, durability, um, and 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 things like that. Um, so, uh, lead in particular, um, <clears throat> they, they their certifications are are looking at everything involved in the lead project. Um, it's not just for uh, AC or green work or sustainability. A, a lead green rater is expected to rate and inspect every every aspect of that. Um, Energy Star has its own certification as well. If you wanted to be an Energy Star Raider, you would have to be a HERS Raider um, because the Energy Star system kind of works off of the the um, HERS program. Um, but but yeah, um, 
a lot of our Austin guys um, do NGBS. Um, so, so some, some, some certified raters can, can look at uh, certain aspects, but for by and large, um, you would need to be like a lead green raider to do lead green homes. Yeah, and just uh, kind of give uh, the short answer is yes. Basically, every single um, every single program is going to have its own credentialing requirements. So IECC is required, IGCC is required to have its own credentialing. Um, those are usually an exam associated with those. Um, Energy Star is a little bit different, but uh, along the same lines, you have to do. It's like an 18 hour course, pass an exam, and then you're able to do energy star inspections. Um, PERS is, is similar. Um, there are credentialing requirements, simul simulators that are required to be passed, uh, written exams that are required to be passed. Um, same thing for lead for homes. You're required to be credentialed as a lead for homes green raider in order to do those inspections. And yes, inspections are required for all of those programs. Um, NGBS is no different. You're required to be a ver verifier, is what it's called. Uh, Green Globes has its um, credentialing process as well. And the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of these have are kind of like stacked or layered programs that kind of fit into each other. So if you're going to participate in LEAD, then by default, you're also participating probably in Energy Star. Um, whether certifying to it or not, you're at least participating in the requirements of Energy Star 3.0 as required in the energy and atmosphere category. Um, so the individual who's doing those inspections will need to be either credentialed in all of them or you'll have, you'll have multiple people doing those inspections. Um, the phases of construction that those inspections take place are one rough and one final. Uh, we, as an organization, actually generally perform three inspections because we find that within those two inspections, you just don't tend to see as much as you need. So we generally do a poly seal inspection, more or less an air sealing inspection, um, where we can take a look at all of those things before the insulation is in place. We'll do a, a pre-drywall insulation, um, and grade the insulation installation and make sure that's all up. Um, up to par and then we'll do a final inspection where we'll do the blower door and any other associated tests and again those are layered so if you're doing a lead we're covering during those inspections we're covering the inspection protocols for each of the associated programs so I gave a short answer and the long answer so hopefully that was conveyed that was they, they were both great okay <laughs> question that a few folks have asked is what is the most popular or the the most commonly used green rating system that they and I'm not expecting either of you to have a you know a full accounting of every building in the U.S. but in in your experience um, which one do you see the most common certification pursued? Um, the, the, the short answer for that is whichever one is most enforced or most incentivized, but by and large, just generally speaking, lead for homes is probably the most widely used. And I think a lot of that is brand recognition lead for homes and USGBC has done a really excellent job in branding and being a market leader in green programs. Um, but like I was saying before, NGBS has done a lot of work over the last five years um to compete for that space um and in my opinion it's been great because now instead of just having one leader in in that area um we have two and you have choices um and and programs that won't necessarily fit one can fit the other but the short answer is is uh, lead for homes is probably is probably leading that in single family uh, multi-family is a different story and again that's because the incentives are different and a lot of times the program participation will follow the incentives and the rebates that are out at that time and and i'm sure that there are um obviously i don't know every single building code out there but there are a lot that are that are tailored for local homes um, and local projects um, but when you when you look into things like what 
Leeds doing? They're, they're, they, they almost have a, um, an international um, uh, position in, in green building. I know that our company has done a, um, a couple of projects out of the country, um, Qatar being one of them, um, where, where Leeds is applicable outside of the U.S. Um, and I'm sure that that lends a lot to its popularity as being able to take it outside of the bounds of the United States. Absolutely. And again, thank you to our attendees for all these great questions. Okay, here's a question. Here's an interesting question related to uh, the the local materials uh, credits. Uh, so if we are attempting to source a uh, material that does not have any sort of local supplier and, and something in wood that we, we might see this in is with machine stress rated lumber or MSR lumber that we sometimes use in trusses, uh, the wood trusses. Uh, there, there aren't very many MSR producing plants. So if folks are attempting to source material that is not available in their region, does LEED or, or do any of the other programs have any allowances that can help accommodate that? Or would it just simply be a credit you wouldn't be able to pursue for that project? So I think I think the green programs recognize some of the constraints within the industry. So those locally produced um, those locally produced options are awarded based on the component. So ex exterior wall assembly is um, meets the requirement. So it may not be every piece of lumber, every piece of wood meets the requirement of a specific credit. Sometimes they that's specific to a component, so a type of assembly, whether that be uh, roof rafters, whether that be floor joists, whether that be a wall assembly. So instead of saying, hey, it's just all of this, all 100% of the wood is locally produced, it's, it's, uh, it's by component, it's by assembly. Interesting. That's good to know. And some of the, the programs um, have in place where, as long as you have a, a proper um, chain of custody, that that you can still you can still apply for that credit even if it's not produced within 500 miles of your site. Great. Um, here's a question on reuse of products. So if you are uh, doing a project locally, for example, and there is a you know recycling plant or facility that uh, sources reclaimed building materials. Are there requirements as to the chain of custody of those materials um, if you if you are trying to source something like that in in your project? For recycled, this question is for recycled content. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So, or or reused. Um. Yeah. So basically, this is going to be based on the the declarations uh, from the manufacturer, and um, and so there's two ways that you can you can get credit for for recycled material. And now that I'm on the spot, I'm going to forget exactly what those percentages are. But um, it's pre-consumer, post-consumer. So if it's pre-consumer recycled material that um, that's being used the pre-consumer uh, recycled percentage is higher. If it's post-consumer recycled, you can get credit at a lower percentage rate. Um, so I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's perfect. All right, I think we have time for one more question, perhaps maybe two, it depends on how, how long we need to discuss them. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about uh, new buildings today. Are there any programs for existing buildings? Uh, you know, say we're doing a renovation or a conversion. Um, can can you talk about you know anything that might be unique to upgrading an existing building or or you know applying for a, a green rating system on an existing building versus new construction? Yeah, so those those programs are by and large available for um, full gut rehabs is generally what it's it's reserved for. So if you are doing some sort of renovation, most of the programs are going to require that the 
project is a full gut rehab. So basically bare bones down to studs and the whole thing's going to be redone. Um, I think NGBS has a, has, does have a program where it's a partial rehab. Um, but from what I understand that's NGBS is kind of, is unique in that way where they, they, they allow a portion. Um, and I know that lead for homes is, is certifies a, on an as unit basis, uh, for single family residential. And then for multifamily, it's going to be on a whole building account. So that won't work, but, um, but lead does allow space for full gut rehab projects. And you said you had one more. I would like to try to answer all the questions if I can. Oh, we have several dozen more. We've, we've got quite a few folks with us today, so we won't get to all of them, unfortunately, but, um, we. I think we've got time for one or two more. So, uh, do you have, so this is kind of just a, a general nebulous advice question. So many structural engineers, uh, may not have worked on green projects in the past or, you know, received much education on them in the past. Do you have any advice or suggestions or, or any, uh, sage wisdom that you would like to pass on to uh, structural engineers working on a green project or or as part of a group working on a green project yeah absolutely uh communication with either the green consultant the green raider anybody who's working on sustainability having that open line of communication is really important um, and the other thing to, cons to, to think about, and you know, we're not oblivious, right? Um, we recognize, and so do all of these programs, that health and safety comes first, right? First and foremost, we need to make sure that these homes and these large pro projects don't hurt anybody. They need to be structurally sound. And that's, that's most of you folks' wheelhouses, uh, that's not ours. So first and foremost, structure is important. So if there is a credit or a requirement that's in direct opposition of something that you understand is, is, is the most appropriate best practice way to do it, there's, there's a lot of space for that. Um, most programs allow exceptions for structural purposes as long as it's notated on the plans. So as long as within the, the plans there's, there's notes, there's a key, there's some sort of there's some sort of designation that, let's say, advanced framing practices can't be done on half of the, the building because of structural purposes. Well, um, Energy Star has exceptions for that, and other programs have exceptions for structural practices that are in opposition of the green measure. So I would just su suggest everybody to keep in contact, keep that open communication, and if you see something that at first smells funny, looks funny, and you know is probably not the safest thing, say something because there's a there's a very, very, very good chance that there's an exception because health and safety um, always has to come first. I don't know if that's well wisdom, said. but it's yeah, there. Yeah, that's, that's well said. All right, last question before we toss it back to Marcy to close us out then. Um, we, we, obviously focus a lot on you know the the embodied carbon and things like that in our building but the other side of the the equation is the energy requirements and how much energy is the building using uh, do you have any methods obviously again unique to or, or specific to wood construction but in general uh, would, would be fine as well um, to improve uh, energy efficiency on a structure Absolutely. Yeah. Advanced framing techniques. So we're talking Cali corners or two stud corners, uh, ladder blocking, um, um, going from two by four, 16 inch on center to two by six, 24 inch on center. Um, those are, are great things that um, you can use to use synergies. So you may not necessarily reduce the use of wood, but what you're going to do is essentially buy somewhere around the same amount of wood or the project will use them around the same amount of wood but that you know that buzzword that everybody really loves those synergies are going to be hit so we're going to have synergies with energy efficiency um, so we're going to reduce thermal bridging so if we have two by six instead of two by four well instead of every 16 inches having a thermal bridge we're going to have a thermal bridge only every 24 inches 
And that reflected on an energy model is a pretty significant impact. Um, the energy models that we generally use are going to be based from rim rate or ecotrope, and those will allow us to um, include that within the energy model. And I can give a percent, ballpark percentage, but I think it's somewhere around um, you know two to six percentage point um, energy in, um, energy improvement for doing something like a two stud or I'm excuse me a two by six framing. So it can be a pretty significant impact depending on where the project already is, and depending on what energy efficiency um, measures are already in place. So if it's a project that's really it's, it's got a lot of low hanging fruit, it's gonna be a really, really big impact. And if you have a project that already has implemented a lot of bells and whistles, the impact may be small, but it's still there. Um, so any type of value engineering, two stud corners, Cali corners, ladder blocking, two by six framing, those are all great for all the programs that we just described. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dylan and Robert, for the presentation and the great discussion today. All right, well, we've had some additional questions come in since we've had our webinar event. So we wanted to record this special extra Q&A with AWC's very own Lauren Ross. He's our Director of Sustainability and Energy. So Lauren, the biggest question that most folks have had is related to the specification of the FSC lumber or an approved equivalent for use in LEED. So can you talk about the, the steps that folks might need to take if they wanted to earn that credit, but they might not be using FSC lumber? Are there other certifications out there that we can, that we can utilize? Uh, or is there something else that folks should know? Yes, yes. Thank you, Lori. So, there is the U.S. Green Building Council, people that make lead, basically, they have, have issued a alternate compliance path for those for FSC. And basically, it, this whether it be 2009 or lead v4, v4.1, it, uh, it basically says that if you do um, sustainable forestry initiative, if your product is, the product you're using is, certified to sustainably forestry in this initiative the american tree farm system the canadian standard association or the program for the endorsement of forest certification that you can first you can obviously take the achieve the point for using legal wood under under lead but also achieve the point for under that sourcing of raw materials um, so that it's an alternate compliance path that they have already issued and so it should be a fairly straightforward pro process great that's great information all right thanks so much lauren we appreciate that and we look forward to you being on our next course thank you thank you very much for joining us have a wonderful day thanks everybody thank you have a good one